Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, all, right. all right, we have uh, quite a few participants that have already signed in. And um, we are going to start right now on time. We have a lot to cover. So welcome everybody, uh, for everybody who signed in. Um, it was amazing to see quite an overwhelming response. And uh, from the from the poll we took, uh, we see we have a good number of entrepreneurs, angel investors, um, and uh, people who are working for uh, um, in finance. Um, so uh, this is our first uh, event with Raffles Family Office. Uh, and as we know, we're here to talk about family offices investing in early stage tech. Um, you know, the current state of the world has really forced us to innovate. Digitization in the past few months has accelerated at a scale that was never thought possible. And, um, you know, as brick and mortar businesses start to uh, navigate and come online, even investors are thinking, how do we get a piece of that pie and, uh, you know, invest in digital transformation, creating new companies in a new world uh, in a safer way that basically will have long term gains for everyone. So here we're going to discuss some of the key issues that concern wealthy families now. And on our panel today, we have uh, uh, Andrea Hajjuhal, and she is the head of capital for Antler and a partner. We have Kendrick Lee, managing partner of the Singapore Raffles family office. And we also have um, Cameron Harvey, uh, managing director of uh, the Raffles family office. And he's based in Hong Kong and the uh, both, uh, and, and, and Cameron is uh, talking to us from the office, which is great. Uh, the rest of us from our homes and uh, in Singapore. Uh, and I am Pooja, I am the uh, director of marketing and PR for Antla. So without further ado, let's start with our three panelists introducing themselves. Uh, we'll start with Andrea and she will give you a brief intro of Antler. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Pooja. Um, absolutely delighted to be here, everyone. Just very quick um, introduction about myself. Um, I joined Antler about two years ago after having worked um, to the top banks uh, for 13 plus years across the globe, primarily looking after these family offices banking and the um, investment side. and I've lived in Singapore for almost uh, 10 years so um, today I'm joining you as well um, from Singapore. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be able to tell you a little bit more about Antler today. Um, I have three slides to cover. I'm gonna do this very very quickly. Um, Antler is a global early stage venture capital firm. Uh, we enable and invest in the world's exceptional people. We uh, who are building the defining companies of tomorrow. Um, we do this through our headquarters here in Singapore and also through our regional presence across, across six continents in all major startup ecosystems. Um, Antler effectively provides institutional access to global early stage venture capital. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, you can see um, here where we are present um, and some of the statistics um, that describe us very, very well. We are investing in the top approximately 1% of more than 50,000 entrepreneurs and ideas that we are evaluating across the globe every single year. Um, today, uh, we have supported over 1,500 entrepreneurs. Uh, we can do this through um, our uh, major presence in these locations, um, as well as a very solid um, global advisory uh, network of more than 400 people who um, are helping um, our founders uh, with their subject matter expertise. Um, Adler is led by um, an experienced entrepreneur and investment professionals, um, including our CEO, who's also our founder, Magnus Grimland, um, who um, most of you who are based in Southeast Asia would recognize the Laura he was one of the co-founders of Zalora, which was subsequently acquired by a global fashion group, um, as well as, for example, as CIO Stefan Yang, who is the founder and former managing director of Rocket Internet here in Southeast Asia, um, who co-founded Lazada, um, which was obviously a, a great um, exit story here um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, Alibaba um, bought it for um, over three billion US dollars and Stefan was also previously the managing partner for Ventura Capital, um, which was at that time uh, one of the largest venture capital firms in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Um, 
Essentially, Adler invests from the earliest stage possible, which is, of course, pre-seed, institutionalizing the friends and, and family round. Um, we, we are therefore systematically the earliest investors and invest at the lowest valuation um, possible with the, with the ability to follow on um, to invest up to Series C alongside top VCs. Um, this is creating um, our investors unrivaled access um, to directly invest into fast growing technology companies. Um, this is, of course, a very interesting proposition, especially for family offices, uh, since uh, they are systematically receiving access to highly curated pipeline. Next slide, please. Uh, Andrea, sorry, you just need to repeat that last part because it was very, um, the sound was really bad. We didn't hear that. I just, I, I essentially I was talking about um, how Antler is investing from the earliest stage possible, which is pre-seed, institutionalizing the friends and family round, um, which is great from a financial perspective because we are the earliest investor systematically at the lowest valuation um, and that our investors uh, are uh, very um, excited to join us on this journey because they receive um, uh, a very highly high quality uh, curated deal pipeline um, into these um, fast growing technology companies um, that we are creating across the globe. Next slide please. Um, just very quickly on the Antler advantage. I mean, most of you would be familiar with the venture capital industry um, and you know that um, you know, deal is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and is actually generating a deal flow through systematic through programs like money or solo, uh, which um, is a very attractive proposition uh, since it's, uh, it's, it's a captive deal flow. Um, of course, the investment decisions are mostly based on individual networks and um, subjectivity. Uh, we are building our own uh, proprietary technology and data platform uh, that helps us identify over a million data points uh, that we are already collecting per annum. Uh, we are global and we've always set out to be global. Um, we've grown Antler um, from our humble beginnings here in Singapore to 12 different locations across the globe, from Australia to LA um, and everywhere else in between. This, of course, brings huge um, amounts of benefits um, to have this global network, uh, both to our investors um, as well as our founders. Um, and then, I, as I mentioned to you before, very importantly, um, if you are an investor who wants to systematically access early stage investments, it's very, very difficult right now. So Antler is bringing uh, this uh, uh, institutionalization to this asset class, which is currently very fragmented. Um, so this is very, very quickly, uh, Antler 101 in about three minutes, I believe. Uh, I would love to hand over now um, to Kendrick, who's going to talk to you um, about uh, Thank you, Andre. Just a little bit about myself and introduction. I'm now I'm the managing partner of Raffles Family Office. I started my career totally to something uh, totally different from the traditional financial space. I was a national athlete, a national badminton player, before making the switch to the financial industry in 2010, before joining Raffles Family Office in 2018. Okay, let me let me walk through. Um, I think uh, Andrea has taken a lot of my time, so I have to run through this <laughs> very quickly. So no problem. Let me give you a quick introduction of Raffles Family Office. We are a multifamily office and independent asset manager that provides wealth management solutions, which includes asset management, investment governance, and family governance. Our offerings of asset management and investment governance helps our clients to meet their investment objectives and relevant structures to bridge the intergenerational gap. Further, family governance adds proper legacy planning in accordance to our clients' wishes or family constitutions. We currently have four offices in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taipei, and Shanghai. We now um, have 60 people in our office globally, and, and we are managing slightly more than $2 billion uh, US dollars. We also have booking centers in, um, in five jurisdictions, mainly Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and now latest Taipei. This five jurisdiction allows us to align ourselves in, with clients and also access valuable deal flows in the private market space. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this actually in the family office space, 
if you if you look from this uh, chart, statistics, the family office industry in Asia is only at its very nascent stage, and we envisage a very rapid growth in this segment. So China by itself is minting two new billionaires every week on average, which led us to analyze the latest investment trends to better understand the changing investment strategies as we experience the great generational shift. We are actually in Asia, we are light years uh, no, behind, behind our more mature peers in Switzerland as well as in, in US. So next slide, please. Okay, this is actually a uh, studies and the statistics shown that you know, the private markets have benefited at the expense of the of public markets, which you know, we will discuss a little bit more uh, in detail. So maybe can I introduce my colleague, uh, Cameron Harvey? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks, Andrea and Pooja as well. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome to all our guests. Just a quick uh, introduction on my own background. I'm originally from uh, Sydney in Australia and I've been in the banking and finance industry um, just on 20 years now, 10 of those spent up here in Hong Kong. Um, and originally came up with Australia New Zealand Bank um, to set up and run their international uh, team within the wealth management business. Subsequently joining UBS and BNP Paribas and uh, this has led me to, to join Raffles at the beginning of last year as managing director. Um, so yeah, looking forward to our, our chat today. Thanks, uh, Cameron uh, and Kendrick. I have a quick question here. Um, if you could just put your answers uh, into the uh, chat box. Uh, also, just some house rules. We will have a discussion and then we'd like all the questions to be in the Q&A uh, box. We're not going to uh, dive in and, you know, uh, take questions directly from you because uh, we have a huge number of participants on this call and we will try our best to address all the questions to help us sieve out the more popular questions. Can we request you please uh, put a thumbs up on the ones that others agree and we will try to uh, address the questions accordingly. So th the next question firstly is to y'all. Typically, how much do you allocate to private markets? If some of you could just put a, a percentage number out there, that would help our panelists uh, address uh, the way they answer the questions. So let's dive right in. One of the main things Kendrick said was about the great generational shift. You know, so this is what is uh, a main problem right now, this intergenerational wealth planning. Um, so uh, what have been your key observations when dealing with multiple generations and wealth planning? Both Cam uh, Cameron and Kendrick, Kendrick can weigh in and also Andrea because you come from a long background of uh, wealth management as well. Sure, okay, allow me to share. Uh, there is definitely an investment mindset gap between these generations, especially the first and second generation as well in Asia. I think it's definitely a case of tradition versus current, uh, versus real estate versus the private markets. I think it's a struggle to accept you know, each other's investment rationale. So this has led to, to a difference in, in mindset in terms of the first and second generation. And that is where we come in to breach the difference uh, in investment mindset. So having said, having said that, because, because of the difference, of course, you know, first generation, they always believe that real estate is the way to go. And that, is, that, is, that happens and that is true 20, 30 years ago. But today's world, the second generation and third generation believes in the private markets where they believe, you know, they are able to get extract alpha in, alpha in, this, uh, in this space. So because of that and the difference in mindset, we come in in between by how, we, how do we bridge the gap? by a uh, cost of investment governance. We do that in the, in the form of probably VCC, other fund structures, and as, as the private market space continues to rise, you know, we can't ignore it. So we have come in to educate both, both generations. Great, thanks. And Cameron, can you give us some examples of what you've seen in terms of this difference in investment mindset with the clients that you deal with? Uh, yes, certainly can. I think um, it's key to understand firstly, um, 
in terms of the different mindset, the first generation are typically entrepreneurs and they've built a company uh, mostly from scratch and gone through a massive growth period over many years and certainly have very strong entrepreneurial and, and uh, business skills. And they can definitely teach the second generation those skills, but often the second generation's uh, role in, in their family's wealth is actually maintaining the wealth and um, that's typically done through investment in, in private and, and public markets as opposed to starting a new company from scratch and growing it. So they're two very different skill sets um, and I think the important thing to remember is that that second generation is also going to need some guidance uh, in how they do that and that's where Raffles comes in. We um, we provide that guidance, we give them advice on how to invest, um, and along with family governance, uh, risk optimization and formal structures to manage their wealth. Um, I think that's, that's sort of the main um, issue when it comes to inter intergenerational wealth transfer. Um, and Andrea, you know, would you like to add in, in terms of, you know, how, I guess, how these two generations define risk in a way? Yeah, before I do that, can, can you guys confirm that you can hear me better now? Because I've got, gotten some <laughs> feedback that you can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm going yes, yes, to stay here. away. I'm going to stay away. So that, that's great. Now, I was just going to share that, you know, my, my, my boss at, at my previous um, uh, a bank where I used to work used to say that if you met one family office, you met one family office. And that's the beauty of family offices. Um, obviously, it's made up of humans and they are all very, very different. But I think we can definitely observe some uh, some, some, some trends and some shifts. But would it, would it actually surprise you, uh, Kendrick, if I told you that um, I was looking at some statistics and globally the allocation of private wealth to VC funds has nearly doubled since 2008. So, okay, that's a 12 year period. Uh, it went from 14% to 22%. Uh, but what's really interesting, just going back to your property point, is that it's overtaken the amount of capital allocated to property investments, which globally was, uh, you know, hovering at about 18%. Um, but that, that just sort of referencing your, your point on that, I think risk is a very interesting question, right? Because I think a lot of people um, associate, um, you know, uh, risk uh, with investments that um, perhaps they don't really understand or they're not really um, used to. Uh, but if I think about risk um, and if I look at, once again, statistics, um, the MSCI World Index had a standard deviation over the last um, uh, 10 years of about 17%. Uh, a VC um, was, was, was standing at about 8%. So that tells you that, you know, venture capital is actually not as, not as risky as... as uh, you know, as, as perhaps people associated with. Of course, that's provided a number of things, right? Because even within VC, um, you know, there are certain things you can do to reduce risk. Uh, one of the one of the other things that we have observed is that there is. Um, uh, the, the risk within a venture capital portfolio declines rapidly um, as you increase the number of investments within that portfolio. So it's very interesting because when you've got five investments in a portfolio, in a venture capital portfolio, um, uh, it, you know, it has a standard deviation of about 1.8. Uh, but by the time you get up to 30, this is hard. Right. Um, this was the, these statistics. Uh, this one specifically um, looked at the, the TVPI um, of a synthetically created um, a 10,000 uh, universe portfolio. So this is very interesting because, um, you know, when it comes to VC, of course, it tells you that um, it matters um, how many components there are purely uh, uh, statistically, but it of course also matters um, who your manager is. And so manager selection um, it also plays a huge, um, a, a huge um, uh, component um, into the success story. Thanks. Yeah. So a lot to think about the way I, I really liked the analogy on, on the property, uh, on property, especially in Asia. And I think that mindset has really changed in terms of, you know, not wanting to own it and invest in other things that the previous generation sees as intangible, so to speak. So for the next um, big area that uh, we've chosen that concerns uh, future generations is 
investing in sustainability now this is a buzzword that is used uh you know in tech in business in investing in everything these days and um it is it is it is such a big word and i want to start uh by defining what sustainability means in the investment context and what does it mean to your clients kendrick and cameron uh you know uh what, when they say they want sustainable investments Thanks, Ojan. It's definitely uh, a buzzword you hear a lot these days in the finance industry and, and for good reason. I think there's multiple aspects to sustainability that families need to consider. Uh, the first one is sustainability of their own wealth, their own company, their own business, not for the next few years, but for the next 50 to 100 years, building a, a real legacy uh, for the future. And, and so sustaining their their wealth and their business is very important, but um, this, you know, tying in with that, I think the other aspect of sustainability is, and, and it, which is becoming more and more important these days, is uh, how environmentally sustainable is it? How socially responsible is our is our company? And a, a good example is um, you know a family that for the past sixty to seventy years has been in the tobacco manufacturing and production industry. And, you know, at one point in time, that was as common as having a mobile phone is these days. Um, however, with you know, technology improvements in healthcare and, and our understanding, um, people have come to realize the impacts on, on health, also on the environment, uh, and, you know, also from a business point of view, increasing tax from governments. So if you're looking at passing that business to the next generation, you've got to be thinking to yourself, you know, is this business really going to be viable for the next 50 to 100 years? I don't think it's going to be. So um, a lot of first generation now are looking at, you know, what sort of businesses they can transition into. And overwhelmingly, that is uh, technology businesses or businesses that have a strong element of technology. And often um, those companies, you know, whilst maybe changing the nature of their company, will be looking at um, you know, how the synergies that they currently have and how they can um, implement those into the new business. So, you know, a pharmaceutical manufacturer that makes drugs, they may look at investing in a company where doctors can diagnose, uh, you know, their, their patients over the internet. Um, and then also those drugs can then be, you know, manufactured, shipped, you know, in the next couple of days, um, you know, to their, to their patients. So, bringing in those elements of technology to a very traditional business. And, and that's become particularly relevant now after what's happened with COVID. Um, you know, we, we take a lot of those things for granted, but um, the way that people do business is changing. And, and if anything, the implementation of technology needs to be more rapid now. Um, and, you know, things like changing supply chains um, as the world you know, decentralizes um, for, for myself, I look at, I probably see 500 deals come over my desk during a year. And whilst I don't go into that much detail on all of them, I need to keep a, you know, my finger on the pulse because my clients will ask me um, at different times that they're looking for certain businesses or, you know, what's popular. And that's definitely technology, whether it's you know, AI, blockchain, even cryptocurrency. And, and another way of accessing that market is, you know, through uh, a company like Antler, who's able to provide the access and diversification to those you know, tech companies for the second generation who's looking at maintaining their you know, family wealth. Yeah, I think adding adding to what um, Cameron has adding to what Cameron has said. We can hear you. Yeah. Adding what Cameron has said. So I think even in the public space, investment mindsets have are changing as well. So I think in, in, it's about understanding what is pertinent in the current environment and future trends. You know, I mean, it's evident in uh, the recent times, I think everybody have heard that Bill Ackman, the latest, um, the largest one, the largest uh, hedge funds, is, has put out of uh, value investing in terms of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. So in that sense, we can actually, uh, we, look, we can actually uh, look at this example that you know, even investment mindset, they have changed out of value into growth. So he's actually looking for, you know, something that can have potentially higher returns. And with that, 
mindset, the change of mindset, you know, we really have to accept that going forward, the private market space could be the new real estate. I think, Kenneth, I'd love to pick up on something that you said, which I think is really interesting, which is that um, what's happening right now in the public space, and, 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 and it's not happening en masse, but it's definitely happening in pockets, is that I think public market managers are looking at their portfolios and saying, okay, how, how is my public market portfolio going to be disrupted, right? If I'm earning uh, you know, a, a hotel chain, uh, should I have really known about Airbnb? Uh, and if I own a bank, um, should I really know about the new fintech entrance, right? And when should I know about this? So I think this information advantage that um, actually having access to, you know, um, early stage company that, that it gives to institutional investors um, is, is also an additional, um, you know, use case. We, we, we talk about this shift, this general shift away from public markets to private markets, but we, we can definitely see it on the ground. We receive a lot more um, queries from very sophisticated institutional investors. Uh, I mean, one of the things that happened last week, and I'm sure that most of you are aware of this, is that for the first time in the history, the federal government in the US has approved that, uh, that within the US 401k scheme, which is the retirement assets um, of employees, uh, they will be able to include private market assets. Uh, which is, um, you know, whatever source you're reading could be up to $400 billion worth of net new money that has to be allocated within private markets, within, just within the United States. So there is definitely a big shift. Thanks. Um, on, I just want to go back to, because you left that point, Kendrick, on basically the mindset shift and sort of the future looking uh, in terms of not real estate, but in other um, verticals. So um, Andre, this is actually for you. So in terms of the future forward looking, what are the trends in terms of VC that you uh, see? Yeah, I think, I think one of them I covered just now, which is it definitely, obviously, from a macro perspective, we, we, we can see a shift from, away from public markets into private markets for various reasons. I think sustainability that Cameron has spoken about um, uh, sort of uh, comes up massively. But what does sort of sustainability mean? If you really um, look at uh, the, the last uh, 10 to 15 IPOs within the US, uh, really only a handful of tech companies are actually making profit. So um, I, I suspect that what we are going to be seeing um, is that those companies that are IPOing, um, they are going to um, uh, have to place more emphasis on sustainable growth uh, and solid metrics, such as, for example, correct unit economics, um, uh, before they be able to, to, to IPO. I think investors are definitely looking at uh, you know, the, the story of Uber, the story of WeWork, um, the story of Lyft, who are still not, uh, uh, you know, uh, profitable companies. Um, I think, you know, just on the subject of the IPO, there's definitely an evidence that companies are taking longer to IPO. Uh, they are staying longer. Uh, there is there's a much more buoyant secondary market. Um, and, you know, the average company um, in, the, in the United States uh, who IPOs went from being eight years old uh, between 1980 to 1999 to being 11 years old um, at the moment. Um, the other thing that we have observed is that, um, you know, the number of publicly traded um, companies in the United States have fallen. Um, uh, basically, over the last 20 years, they almost halved, right? So I think that there's definitely a, another trend, uh, which is which is around, um, you know, reducing the number of companies who are striving to um, to IPO as their main exit strategy. Um, I think that there are two other things. One is that we can also see uh, that top tier managers are investing earlier and earlier, um, given the financial opportunities uh, are very exciting at this stage. There is definitely a structural alpha. Um, there's two examples that I wanted to bring up. One was Sequoia, um, who's been doing launching and doing their search program for the last 18 months. And then just, just um, earlier this month, Anderson Horowitz, the most well-renowned venture capitalist on the globe um, has announced that um, they are launching a talent um, opportunity fund, investing at the earliest stage possible, basically investing in, in talent out of the United States. So there's definitely a, a trend there. 
And then I think once again, you know, Cameron covered this, but it's super important. Responsible investing keeps on coming up, both with the institutional investors as well as, as, as private investors. And I think just looping it back to our, um, you know, original theme around uh, converging convergence with family values. I think this is where, um, you know, at the heart of the VC uh, is, is really an entrepreneur with a vision and, and they want to make a difference uh, while making a return. Um, and I think that, they, you know, investing into VC for private investors, of course, gives a great opportunity for these two or three generations to bring their value sets together um, and um, and actually consider, okay, what matters to them, what industry matters to them, uh, and, and actually double down on, on that in an ESG compliant way. Thanks, Andrea. I think you've actually covered a lot of the points for the third uh, section that we were going to talk about, which, um, you know, I'm just going to tell the audience, the third main concern uh, of uh, families is, uh, you know, how best to ensure family unity. And as you know, the three of you have mentioned, these values of sustainability and, um, you know, environment, and also uh, having an impact in what you're investing in uh, are, are sort of the new values of the younger, the, the, third, the third generation and onwards. So, um, you know, uh, there are so many questions and I'm going to start uh, because otherwise we're not going to have time to uh, answer everybody's questions. So what I'll do is I will read out the name of the person the question is from, the question. And uh, it, in, in most cases, it's directed at uh, specific uh, speakers. Um, so the first question, uh, it's says it's to all panelists. Um, how does, how do family offices see an emerging GP, someone who is forming the first fund after doing some early stage successful investments and the GP contribution in the first fund is a bit higher? Is this level of GP contribution uh, positive for family offices or negative? Did you get that? Can we repeat that question again? Okay. Um, how do family offices see an emerging GP? Uh, is who is forming the first fund after doing some early stage successful investments? Um, do you want? So I'll just jump in quickly. But usually, uh, after they've, you know, perhaps set up their company, run it, exited, made the, you know, their first pot of gold, so to speak. Um, that's when they would come to you know, a family office such as ourselves to assist them with setting up uh, you know, a fund like through the VCC program in Singapore, for example, um, and, then, and then to help them run it and also you know, look at different ways of diversifying their, their assets, their investment. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, typically what we do day to day here. I, I just wanted to add something in here, which is because there's good news for a new GP um, uh, coming onto the market, right? Um, what's been again happening, um, it's a trend that's been um, consistent since um, early 2000s, is that um, there, there's been a broad-based value creation, there's, there's geographical access. Uh, it basically means that the, that the success of funds, of new fund managers, is no longer limited to a handful of um, uh, of, of fund managers, right? So um, Cambridge Associates, I think, did, this, did a report where they said, um, let's look at um, back from, I think it was early 2000 all the way to sort of uh, 2016 or 17, I can't really remember, but essentially um, they, they did a report where they said, in fact, uh, new funds, which is defined as, I think, fund one and two, uh, significantly, um, significantly outperform uh, all the funds uh, at multiple instances. So in a sort of 10 year period, in about 60% of the time, if you would have invested with a new GP, um, you know, you would have been, uh, you, you would have been better off than going with a fund uh, three or four. And uh, I think that is good, good, uh, good news. But I think you know the reality remains that when you are a new GP, uh, it's very difficult to to sort of raise capital, or it's more difficult to raise capital uh, than it would be when you are you know a, a fund with an actual fund track record. Uh, that's that remains the case. But I think that the market, given that the, that we've talked about the trend that 
more capital is coming to this market. I think that this is a positive development for this particular uh, you know, pocket of the industry. Thanks, Andrea. Um, this Kendrick and Cameron could probably answer uh, from Isaac Hung. Uh, what kind of early stage tech, I guess he's talking about verticals, are family offices interested in? Are there specific uh, verticals that they're interested in investing? I think for, for as of now, um, we're definitely looking at a lot more sustainability. I think ESG is definitely one of the things that you know a lot of a lot of new uh, generation, the latest generation, is looking at. You know, second, third generation, they're always looking at what is sustainability, what how can it impact um, in terms of environment. So anything related to that, like for instance, uh, we're getting a lot of interest in terms of even electric cars. You know, something that is more environmental friendly. You know, something that is to do with our health, health tech. You know, so it's along, it's always along uh, the lines that we see a lot of interest in. And and when you get something like this, Kendrick. So if, if there is a thematic conviction by a client uh, who says to you, "Hey, I I, I want to um, invest in electric cars," um, you know, obviously the one could go to the public markets again, but the choices are, um, are, are relatively limited and, and, the, and, the, and the price and the valuation has uh, significantly increased. How do you guys go about actually thematic, you know, trying to provide a solution for the clients um, in a thematic fashion? Yes, of course, we, I mean, we have, we definitely do our own due diligence in terms of, you know, of course, uh, in terms of uh, compliance uh, in terms of investment, does it make sense for clients? As you said, I mean, totally agree that, you know, if you go to a public space, public markets, you know, valuation may be sky high. But of course, and we want to spot, of course, you know, um, if you go into the private markets, you always spot potentials. What can be the next, you know, the next big thing? What could impact the future trends? And so we, we do our own um, due diligence, you know, investment committee comes into play, see does it make sense in terms of valuation? And, and stuff like that. So, yeah, and uh, then we propose to a client and, we, and to see if it makes sense. Okay, uh, then coming back to the original question as well, um, there isn't specifically one type of uh, technology investment that investors and families are looking for. It's quite diverse. Often it has some synergy with their core business because they're looking at how they can add to that investment or complement it. Um, but I think if, if you have a very compelling investment case, you will get investment. That's really what uh, those entrepreneurs should be looking at when they're you know, building their company rather than tailoring something to what they think the market wants. They should also be uh, you know, looking at making a really compelling, useful product. And then you know, you'll, you'll be able to pitch it and you'll, you'll find investment. Okay, the next one, I think all three of you can uh, weigh in. Basically, what kind of investment size is the typical amount in early stage tech? Again, um, I would say the investment size is very diverse. It, um, you know, it can be from very small amounts, 100,000 US to um, probably for very early stage up to about 5 mil US. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as, long as uh, the investment case is compelling. I don't think your your issue will be finding the investment or the size of the investment. But a lot of the um, VC funds, and, and I'm sure Andrea can talk more about this, but uh, VC funds investing in early stage tech usually, I think, up to about five million US. Sorry, um, sorry, Jamin. Mean, I think um, also is the percentage of the overall portfolio. I mean, when we manage uh, as a family office, we, you know, in terms of the investment space. You know, it's about allocation into this space because I think VC space, yes, I mean, um, it's right that, you know, Cameron has rightly pointed out, you know, it's usually small allocation and very diverse. So, um, and also we have to see the overall portfolio. What is the, you know, in terms of the family's objectives, what is the proper or rather um, right allocation and the, and the family is comfortable with. Okay. This next question is from Audrey the Dumas. Uh, do you see meaningful variations between how different family uh, offices across Asia, Hong Kong versus China versus Southeast Asia, invest in private markets and VC? Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat what are the differences in the ways 
family offices in, in, in different parts of Asia. So let's say China versus Southeast Asia uh, invest in private markets and VC. Um, I can I can take I can take some of this. Um, so I think we we, we have um, a number of investors who are, who are sitting in that jurisdiction, and I think that the the first question to ask is what is your primary objective when you when you're investing into venture capital fund? Um, are you motivated by purely are you motivated purely by financial upside, or are you a strategic investor? So if um, if you are a financial investor, then obviously um, you, you, exactly what Kendrick was saying, you would take a look at your overall asset allocation um, and, and you would you would pick a manager um, and you would allocate to it and then you would sit back and wait for the financial upside right uh, on a portfolio basis but more often than not I think venture is a little bit more emotional than that right a lot of people um, invest into venture um, for strategic benefits ultimately a lot of people also want to get direct access to the underlying companies and we see this um, trend um, most certainly across our investors. So we have investors who've invested in a multiple fund of ours, both in and out of their own jurisdiction. And the difference being is that when they are in the jurisdiction, they get involved. They want to uh, be able to advise some of the companies that they are interested in. They potentially want to be able to uh, you know, invest in them uh, directly. They most certainly want to get to know them very, very, um, very, very early on. Whereas when it's out of jurisdiction, that's a little bit uh, more difficult to do. So I think you always have to ask yourself as a family, what is what objective are you actually achieving with investing into VC? Is it a financial investment? Is it a strategic investment? Is it an impact investment, right? Is, the, is, are you, is your primary motivation that? In reality, it's probably almost um, always a mixture of the three, uh, but there is always a sort of uh, leader within those three motivators. And we see this across Asia Pacific. Thank you. Um, okay, so, you know, given the COVID climate, of course, uh, investors are more cautious. So this question is, about client, are you seeing clients taking a more cautious approach to VC investing this year? Has the appetite to invest uh, changed and uh, valuation expect expectations, have they also changed? I'll take this, the, the, the last bit. I think for us, we play at the very early stage, right? Um, so uh, we are uh, the least correlated to what's happening at the later stage markets, right? Um, both um, post IPO and, and just before pre IPO. So for us, this has not been um, an issue at all. And this is why we have, we have always been committed to the early stage and are very excited about the um, early stage. Um, in terms of um, VC um, allocation, uh, what I can tell you is that we still receiving a lot of interest from uh, family offices but also from institutions um, as well uh, so for us we haven't seen uh, um, a real decline um, in interest uh, but we are not only talking to private clients we're also talking to um, institutional investors who have of course a much more um, a longer period of, uh, uh, of, of, of gestation so you have to start a conversation now to be able to secure investment in nine months 12 months time um, so we, we from our perspective really we are as busy as we, we we've been but once again we don't just focus on private clients so Kendrick or Cameron yeah. I, I would also add that uh, you know, when you get to this level of wealth, ultra high net worth, family office level of wealth, you typically do have cash set aside and, and available for investment in times such as these. So uh, the demand is definitely still there. And in fact, a, a lot of clients are actually looking for um, opportunities that are you know, created by times like this. Um, in fact, not many people realize that Asia is the largest distressed asset. Um, investment region in the world. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the demand is still there. And, and in fact, a lot of opportunities have arisen uh, recently, which, are, you know, which people are considering. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. We still see demand there um, this year. I think the demand has not, has not weaned off. And a lot of people actually understand. I mean, sharing what uh, Andreas mentioned earlier about this you know, the private space as well as the public space in terms of volatility. I think a lot of investors out there, you know, in terms of um, standard deviation, talking about standard deviation, they actually acknowledge that the private space um, are actually a lot more stable uh, in terms of, you know, less, provides less standard deviation. 
and less volatility as compared to the public markets when they have they experienced the um, the March you know correction with the, the steep correction in March, and that's where they realized that oh you know actually the private market space is not as volatile as that. So yeah, we definitely still see a lot of demand in this uh, in this space this year. Yes, I mean investments are still taking place, and uh, there is there is the deal still happening for sure. Um, this next question is from uh, Sundaram MS. Uh, a particular risk relating to investing in early stage tech companies is that you don't buy into a group of companies. Um, I think this uh, Andre will address because it's specific to Antler. Um, so the chances of succeeding are lower. Um, and it takes an average of seven years to sell a tech company. And most of the return comes from a few hyper successful outliers. Should investors therefore take a portfolio approach to have the best chance of catching the winners? I think all of you can weigh in on this. It's a great question. Yes, the answer is yes. So I, I, absolutely. Look, unless you have the capacity, the resources, the talent, um, yourself or in-house to be able to do proper due diligence um, on, um, a, on on every single deal that you are um, you are investing in, uh, one would suggest that uh, you're better off um, outsourcing this functionality, right? Whether you outsource that to a family office who then does the manager selection for you if you're going down the venture capital route or they do the actual um, investment, direct investment opportunities, I think that um, it's it's very difficult to argue that uh, you know early stage is is still um, super volatile, uh, but. Uh, with a bit of research uh, and uh, great due diligence, uh, there is definitely an argument to be had for diversification, which is what I mentioned about half an hour ago, uh, and it, it significantly reduces the chance of failure. If I take a step back and think about why Antler was started, if you look at statistics, um, there, the, wherever you look, it's 90% plus of startups fail. And the reality of it is, is that they fail for, for three reasons, fundamentally. There's no market product market validation, the wrong founders are working on it. And as a result of one and two, they run out of capital. So we started Antler thinking about this and, and thinking, what if there was a place where you could reduce the, 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 the failure rate, right? You can never truly eliminate it, but what if there was a place where you could you could do that through proper due diligence? Uh, you know, we spend over 400 hours of due diligence uh, with every single founder we invest in without spending a single penny on them, right? And that's really, really important important and still they will, they will fail, right? So just going back to the original premise, um, I believe very, very, very passionately that when you are making early stage investments, uh, it is very smart to actually have a portfolio approach. Diversification is, is definitely one of the key tenets of investment. And I'm sure everyone's heard of, um, of you know, the idea that when you're buying a stock portfolio or a bond portfolio, you need to diversify your investments. Why should that not apply to you know, private equity or venture capital investment as well? You definitely need to have that um, level of diversification in your portfolio to spread your risk. And um, you know, doing that through a fund is definitely the, uh, the easiest, cheapest, most efficient way to do that for most investors. Um, you know, because the amount of time that you need to spend on due diligence, the costs involved, it's just simply not feasible for your average investor to do that, as Andrea said. Great, thank you. There's so many more questions and we have a uh, little time left. So I am just going to start picking. Um, uh, and in, I think that this question is, do you prefer direct investing or investing in a VC fund? And this is for RFO. <laughs> uh, would you like to answer that? It really depends, you know, um, of course, investing in fund, you don't get direct access, you know, the upside is, of course, it's for diversification, but, you know, if you invest directly, of course, you spot, you, you spot, if you spot a winner, then you'll be a multi, you know, multiple bagger. So I think if you go into a VC fund, it's, it's, it's very different. Um, it's very different dynamics. You know, you, do you want to expose fund of funds or, you know, just simply diversify into, um, and, and, diversify your risk it's it's really depends on the objectives of what you what you hope to achieve 
Yeah, I think I think it goes back to the previous point, doesn't it, Kendrick, which is to do with the fact that how involved do you want to be? And if we link it back to, you know, um, is, is, is the family, is the family office led or, or, or participated by the second, third generation who actually want to be, if they want to take majority stakes, uh, that of course, um, depending on the stage where they come in, uh, uh, w would obviously um, cost a lot more. So it goes back to Cameron's point around, you know, over rest allocation. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of um, thought that must go into it. Um, and when one decides, but I think it's entirely to do with, you know, industry expertise, minority, majority ownership, uh, what is the main objective uh, that we are solving for, you know, a lot of the time families um, in Asia Pacific are still business owners, right? So they also have an additional objective, which is that they want to enhance their current business, they want to digitalize it, they want to modernize it. So they look at um, as startups, not just uh, as a potential investment, but also uh, but also some something that adds them strategic value and adds the um, operating business strategic value. So all of these um, considerations, I suspect that both Kendrick and Cameron, when you're talking to your clients, you you, you know you're really talking to them about what is it that you want to achieve with with, with this investment. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay, we'll take uh, two more questions. The second last, when considering portfolio allocation to BC Tech, do you delineate? Uh, differentiate between early stage, so seed, series A, B, and growth equity? And if so, what is the split or is it subjective? Sorry, could you repeat that question? When considering portfolio allocation to VC tech, do you differentiate between early stage, seed, series A, series B, so early stage and later series? and growth equity? And if so, how is this split allocated or is it subjective? Um, yeah, I mean, look, there's all different stages that you can, you can enter. Obviously, the earlier you're entering, potentially the higher risk, uh, but the later you're entering, the lower the valuation that you're getting is. So again, comes back to diversification. I, I wouldn't say that anyone's only looking at uh, you know, C round, anyone's only looking at a uh, you know, family and friends rounds. I think it's really depends on the opportunity, but probably you, you generally be uh, looking towards getting in earlier if you are going to enter, you know, private equity or venture capital investment, the earlier you get in, better the valuation, um, you know, so you can do all your due diligence and, and uh, work out whether it's a good investment at that stage, generally speaking. Um, but then again, you know, at a later stage, of course, you can see how the company's progressed. In later funding stages, they're often post revenue, the business is more developed, um, even up to, you know, pre IPO round. So, yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on the opportunity, but uh, I wouldn't say there's, you know, only one specific round that you always look at. Um, and, and overall, I would say people tend to prefer to get in earlier to get a better valuation. Thanks. So I'm gonna, I've got two more questions, one specifically for Andrea and one is specifically for Kendrick. And um, so Kendrick, this is uh, for, for you. Compared uh, to private banks, what can family, family offices offer in terms of private market? Okay, um, in terms of family office, because we sit of course on the side of clients, you know, we understand the clients needs, I mean, what they hope to achieve or what they hope, you know, to, um, to get into, I mean, their investment strategy. So I think in that aspect, aspect you know, uh, we do definitely do differently from the banks because banks, are, they are doing it on a broad base, uh, basis and they usually do it in funds, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the form of funds. So, I mean, coming from a client's uh, perspective and sitting on, on their side, you know, it's about understanding um, the different investments, uh, investment strategies, you know, what they look out for, what are they interested in, in, is it in terms of their business, in terms of you know, strategic holdings, in terms of investment holdings, you know. So this is, this is something that we do very, very differently from banks. And I think in that sense, there's a lot of more personal touch, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, being very precise in getting um, to be aligned with what the family actually once. Great. And, you know, to end on a forward-looking note, on a big picture, uh, you know, is, 
is this, Andre, could you say this is a growing trend towards early stage investments by family offices? Is this what you're seeing in terms of interest as well? I think we most certainly see um, a trend uh, from professional investors to invest into early stage and, and you know, Antler is at the forefront of that. In terms of family offices, um, we have most certainly been, um, you know, supplying uh, our, our um, you know, our product to, to, to them um, to augment their um, product offering from other channels and most certainly that demand has not uh, has not gone down if anything um, it keeps on increasing I think there is always you know people are always interested to, to hear the story and I think that goes back to something again very human which is that every single one of the startups that one invests in has a story and there are people behind it and there is technology and there is ultimately solutions for problems right and so I think it is um, it is, you know, it, I, I get a, a lot less people being not interested in the antler story because I think everybody wants to hear what is up and coming, what is happening um, across the globe, because we are simply at the forefront of innovation, at the really real grassroots of innovation. Um, some of our investors uh, have invested across multiple funds and their primary objectives have been just that, just to know what's happening in Sydney versus New York, Stockholm versus Singapore. And it's as simple as that. So I think for, you know, my, my, my two cents on this is that this trend is not going away. I think that people are um, feeling more and more comfortable going early stage and most certainly there is a uh, growing interest in this uh, from the private client space um, and we are super happy to partner with uh, the likes of RFO um, who are serving their clients with being able to provide them with products um, and solutions that uh, they probably wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. Thank you, um, all, all of you, for giving us such insightful perspective in this space and uh, this topic that is clearly becoming more popular and uh, these two different verticals working together more closely. So um, we had a really good active uh, audience as well today. I'm sorry I couldn't, uh, we couldn't answer all the questions. I tried hard. And, um, you know, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so I just, we want to throw it back to you, you know, um, please email uh, either of us, uh, RFO or Antler, and tell us what you would like to hear about investing in early stage tech and these sort of uh, topics that we'd like to do more of. And, and we'd like to tailor it according to what the investment community wants to hear and, and, and wants to talk about in the current context and climate of things. So once again, thanks, Kendrick, Andrea, Cameron. That was great. And, um, and our lovely audience. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Likewise, thank, thanks for having us. It's great to be a part of this and, and thanks to everyone who participated. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.